Okay, thank you. Good evening, everybody. We'll, uh, we will make a start. And um, if you're looking around thinking, why on earth did we put this out on the bench, right? This is the first evening we've run of this type, and we've never had this uh, for a year and before. So I wasn't sure how many people we were going to get for each individual session. What I desperately didn't want to do is be sending people away, which is why we put it on event right. So thank you, those of you who brought your tickets along and showed me on the way in. Apologies, you've, you've used your ink on that. A um, couple of things I want to explain about what this evening is going to be. And um, certainly this is an information evening for parents and lots of students come along as well, that's fantastic. And um, I am inviting you to actually, I will say, I was up in Edinburgh um, with my daughter this weekend. We went up to our open, open day session to work she's interested in Henry University. Went to a session like this and she turned to me and she said, Dad, don't be that parent. And so I'm inviting you to be that parent. If you have a question, please do ask that question. All right, you are very welcome to be that parent. And your children that brought with you, they'll just have to deal with it and they'll be okay. Um, this session, just so you know, and, and the camera definitely pointed on me, this session is being recorded because of course we've got lots of people who want to be a team and couldn't be. So we've got camera pointing me and this session will be available later on. Uh, for you to watch again if you want to. You'll get a copy of the PowerPoint that we share. Some of the slides will make no sense at all uh, without the annotation that goes with them. So just bear, bear that in mind. Um, you might want to watch it later on again in case you've forgotten what any of the slides are about. Um, similarly, whilst I'm inviting you to be that parent, I want to make it absolutely clear, I'm not going to be that teacher. And in that sense, what I'm going to explain is an experience I had uh, quite a few years ago where I was, went to one of these sessions and, and I was told what a good parent would do and I left infuriated because uh, the suggestions I'm giving you are just suggestions this evening. You know your child considerably better than we do and it's not for me to tell you the things that you have to do with what will work for one child will not work for another and certainly I'm not going to be the teacher says you have to do all of these things to quantify and qualify as a good parent. They are purely suggestions if you disagree with any of them, that's okay too. But if there's some things you take away and think, fantastic, I'm going to try that, then that's what this evening is all about. So just to give you the, the headlines, I've already shared these with you. Um, so there's lots of information here. We're going to have around 45 minutes. Um, we may not take that on the presentation, but we've got time for questions during and after as well. So the four things that we'll have a look at. Um, some key dates and deadlines for Year 11. Some strategies and our suggestions to support home learning including managing workload, and that's certainly the evening, welcome to um, And certainly, the idea of managing workload in year 11 in particular is something, is something that causes students a lot of anxiety, and we're going to be talking about anxieties as well. Um, we've got revision techniques, and again, definitely really clear on this one, what works for one student does not work for another. And so we'll go, that does not work for me, that's fine, park it, we'll look at other, um, other techniques. And then we are going to look at some subject specific, specific information and guidance. Um, however, along with the PowerPoint presentation and the link to this uh, presentation as well, you are going to get a full revision booklet with information on every single subject and how we recommend that you revise on those subjects. As a mathematician myself, I suggest that the way to revise mathematics is very different to the way you might revise some of the other subjects. Um, the first thing I do want to say, however, is absolutely a huge thank you to each and every one of you for coming along this evening or for those people watching the presentation at home. There are, for me, two things that have the biggest impact on student achievement, and one of those things is parental engagement and the fact that we work together as a trio with the school, the student and parents. If we work together and collectively, that will lead to the best possible outcomes for students at home. And when we work together, that's what leads to those outcomes. So there's lots of information you can share in here, and there'll be some ideas you can take away, and that's the idea about working collectively. Uh, the other one I want to talk about is attendance. Um, I'm just going to share some statistics. These are the live statistics this year um, on attendance. So just if I can just pick that out, there we go, that point it does work. So we're currently on, we've got year 11 here, uh, and currently in week six, there has been an, an increase in illness over the last few weeks, and I think everybody's recognised that in the local area. Uh, we've had, I do know where some people that have been testing, and that's been people who um, have been contacted at school that they've been testing, and a friend and family at home, they said they've been testing. But for whatever reason, people have been tested recently, as I understand it, there have been some people testing positive for COVID. We can't report there's been an increase in COVID cases, that would be responsible for us to do so, because of course we haven't been testing over the last six months periodically, so we don't know where we're at. But there has been, definitely been an increase in illness, and you can see here, you can see here this downward trend over time, and we're looking at in week six for year 11, 89.2%, uh, uh, and last week it was 88.6% attendance. And certainly with the, with the illness, this illness will 
fast and already we're seeing the improvement in attendance again. I want to share with you some, some statistics that we took from, not last year, because we haven't got the official figures on that, but the year before. And something called Progress 8, which is abbreviated there as P8. And if I just show you that, for our cohort of students that we had, year before last, 256 students, the school's Progress 8 figure, which is never reported for individual students, it's just for the school, uh, was negative 0.18. And what that means is 18 grades in 100 were one grade lower than they were expected to be, compared to everybody else in the country nationally. So you look there, 18 grades in 100. However, what we did was we stripped that down by attendance. And if I just look out for you there, that those students, we had 28 students in that year group that had 99% attendance or higher, their progress age score was 1.3. Okay, that means that 130 out of 100 grades were higher than they were expected to be. Our students on average were achieving over a grade higher in every single one of their subjects where they had greater than 99%. If I just go down statistically, 97% uh, 97 attendance, our students were achieving almost a grade higher than their peers nationally from the same starting point with the same prior attainment, with the same score scores from key stage two. If I show you at 95%, two thirds of a grade higher than their peers. The, res the results students get as in high school are very, very good. And then we look here at 90%, which of course is one day off a fortnight, actually 0.28, so uh, students are almost a quarter of a grade higher. Where we saw the huge drop that resulted in this figure over, uh, over the whole school was the 41 students that had less than 80 percent attendance, where on average their grade was almost two grades higher in every single subject that they sat. So the two things that definitely contribute most to success and ultimately at the end of year 11 is working collectively with parents and good attendance at school. And there are lots of reasons for attendance, so they get that and understand that, but we can show here that students who attend regularly do well in school. Um, I am hoping, and this, this picture um, is a little bit beyond where I'm hoping all students will be, I'm hoping that come the end of year 11, all of our students will be going into their examinations with a little bit of worry. Okay, because I think a little bit of nerves focuses the mind. And certainly tonight, it's having a conversation about examining anxieties and what we can do to support our students. In terms of anxieties, there's a full range there, a full spectrum of how those anxieties manifest themselves. And there will be some anxieties that students have that we can solve very, very quickly. And then, uh, at the other end of the spectrum, there will be some students who need more support and you'll be aware at home if you should need more support and potentially you've already contacted school and you're working with us and we're looking at potentially we have um, we have 29 members of the pastoral team we work with over 50 different agencies to support students and some students for example may be working with the mental health in schools team but certainly tonight what I want to talk about is I want to talk about the anxieties where you haven't contacted us where we aren't aware because what I tell all students leading into the exam period is let us do as much of the worrying for you as we can. There'll be things that students are worried about that actually if they came and spoke to us about we would be able to alleviate very quickly. There'll be some things that we need to put more support in place for you within. It might be not something that we can solve quickly. But I urge you to contact us and let us know if students are worrying. So there are some, uh, some faces up there, of course the students will recognise, which are some people you might need to be aware of. I oversee everything in terms of the assessment, the examinations, the GCSEs, all of the qualifications. So if it's a concern about examinations in particular, it would be myself you'd be in contact with. And then I mentioned about the 29 members of the pastoral team. There are three in particular dedicated to working with Year 11. So we've got Mr Ridgway, who's here this evening, as head of upper school. We've got Miss Dickinson, who's dedicated to as the head of Year 11. And then we've got Miss Bowen, who is a pastoral manager, non-teaching member of staff who supports uh, who supports Year 11 and Year 10. So they are the first ports of call. So we've got three members of the pastoral team and myself in there with curriculum issues. They are your first, first ports of call in terms of contact. But then, you might have a subject-specific inquiry. And we have 10 dedicated curriculum leaders, uh, six of those up there. And this was, like I say, this PowerPoint will come home to you so you don't need to take note of that, uh, who those people are. But there are um, six of our curriculum leaders. If you have a particular question, uh, about a subject that you want to, to have some help with, if something is causing you anxiety, there are six of our curriculum leaders there, and, and the other four curriculum leaders there. So we have ten colleagues in school. If there are anything that are specifically, uh, uh, SEA 
in the related thing, Mr. Bre uh, Mr. Brennan, he is the gentleman to contact. His email address is senko at haslingdenhigh.com. All of the others are their first initial and then the surname. So we've got D. Shaw at Haslingdenhigh, uh, and Berkeley at Haslingdenhigh. However, a much uh, better way, a quicker way to contact those is if you go onto the Contact Us form on the school website, put in what your concern is, it will be directed straight over to those groups of staff, so you don't need to remember those emails. Right, key dates in the diary now, some key dates to run through. Now, I appreciate some people want to take a photo of, of those ones, um, but it's going to be shared with them, hoping to send it out tomorrow morning. So next Thursday, we've got the sixth form open evening, and we're hoping that lots of our students will be looking to join us in the sixth form to do uh, A-levels or vocational qualifications. And then, I've already had students handing me for their mock exam timetable. It is not yet written, and it is a work in progress, but the mock exams start on the week beginning Monday the 20th of November. And they're going to run for two weeks. And the reason, I want to particularly just to pause on those for a moment, that is a very intense two weeks in school. There will be some days where some students could have three examinations on the same day. The likelihood of you having that in your GCSEs, your final GCSEs at the end of the year, is very slim. It could happen, but the likelihood of it happening is very slim. The mock exam period is much more intense than the actual GCSE period, which is spread over five weeks of the half term in the middle. So Monday the 20th of November, we start the mock exams, we have two weeks. You will then get the results home. I want to make sure we mark them accurately and correctly. You will get the results home on Monday the 15th of January. They'll come home on the reports. And then the important date for the diary is the seven, Wednesday the 17th of January, which is the year 11 parents evening where we give that gives us the opportunity to have that conversation with you about the exam results themselves. We'll have already had a look, we'll have analysed them, we'll identify the areas where students need to focus their attention. So after that, um, the students will start to do what they need to do to improve in those areas. And then we have, on month, week, year, Monday, 4th of March, we have what we call light touch assessments. Uh, they're assessments that take place in lessons, um, but they aren't uh, quite as rigorous as the full mock exam period, which is always back-to-back -back exams. For the entire week. Typically, some people only have one assessment, and it might be up to it might be 45 minutes long. So it's a lighter touch, just to see how the students have improved, and then the reports will come home for those on Monday the 15th of April. And then on Thursday the 9th of May, that is when the written GC, uh, GCSE exam season starts. There will be some spoken examinations, such as like languages. There'll be some practical examinations um, in music, for example. You'll have to do those. But the formal written exam season starts on, Monday, uh, on Thursday the 9th of May. There is always a contingency day. The last examination, actually time travel, I think it's either the 21st or 22nd of June. The contingency day is in the event of any disruption that causes one of the examinations that has to be moved. Uh, now, year on year for the last however many years, the thing that we've been used to be taught to use the example is the death of our monarch. Now we're hoping that we don't experience that within the next, uh, within the next year. But there are some things that could result in an exam being rearranged, so that's the contingency day. And then Thursday the 22nd of August, which comes around much quicker um, than you expect, that will be in here, GCSE results day, and the idea is we'll be celebrating lots of successes. Um, if I could just take a moment to explain the GCSE grades, um, because around seven years ago they have changed, and, and certainly as to why they needed to change, that was definitely something that uh, Mr. Gove decided that the, we needed to shake up the GCSE system. So the students now, they'll be very familiar with these, uh, the uh, 9 to 1 system, or the 1 to 9 system from 1 up to grade 9, with the U uh, at the bottom there. Replaced the A star to uh, A star to G with U at the bottom there, that replaced that system. So in terms of the very top end grades, the A star A, which is the one uh, that uh, is often reported, that got replaced with 789. And then the old C grade value that used to be reported, that got replaced with grade 4 and grade 5. And you notice they've blurred the two there, so a, a grade 5 is not N C lower in B, and a grade 6 um, is uh, equivalent to a grade B. So just an idea of what those grades mean. Talking to students today, and they were asking me, and this would be attention, is what to pass. Every single one of them is pass. However, Lots of colleges, um, lots of employers, and potential article passes at various levels. A grade four is referred to as a standard pass, and that's the one that students are expected to achieve five of, typically, to go on to um, uh, other associates. We are 
five or an article. A grade five is a strong pass. Okay, so just an idea about those qualifications. A couple of things just to pick up on, and this won't be relevant to everybody. Um, exam access arrangements. Some students will already have exam access arrangements. Uh, and they are pre exam adjustments and candidates based on evidence of need in a normal way of working. So some students will have things like a word processor, we use a word processor, a scribe, they'll have extra time. They are as a result of assessment that we have to put in place to identify that that is a need. And if you feel there's something there that we haven't particularly identified and we need to pick up on, there may be a need for that, they do contact us, contact myself, contact the, the school, same code, and we will put those assessments in place. It is vital they are the normal way of working. So we cannot have a scenario where a student goes all the way through um, year 7 through to year 11, never having used any of these, and then at the time of the GCSE says, I want to use them now, I think I need them. Well, we have to justify when the inspector comes in why a student is using those resources. And so therefore, for that reason, it's got to be the normal way of working. So if a student, for example, was to use a word processor for all assessments, then during the mock exam period, then students must be using the word process that we will put in place. They can't say, I don't want to use it then, but the GCSEs I will. They've got to be using it throughout. And those students, if they're using word processes, they may be using their iPads, or they may have a keyboard in class, they've got to be using those. So that's just about exam access arrangements. One of the requests I often get is around the exam room. We are the second largest school in Lancashire. Our exam venue holds 250 students. And some students, I mentioned about the anxieties, that room itself is quite an intimidating room. And ultimately, our, our practice that we do in terms of the mock examination is to get students used to that room. I get a lot of requests saying, can we move them to an alternative room? And in fact, to the point where if I moved every single request to an alternative room, the alternative room would end up being bigger than the exam venue in the first instance. So please be aware, if, I, if, you, if you do feel that's something that says you do want to hear, we need to look at explicitly what is the need for it. it. It needs to be beyond anxious about exams. Because like I mentioned earlier, the expectations of all students are a little bit anxious about the exams. So just be aware of that. If you do contact me and we have that conversation, I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm definitely bound by the guidance from the Joint, uh, the joint Council of Qualifications. Special consideration is something I definitely want to mention, and, and unfortunately every year some students are affected by things that happen to them, and they may get ill, they may experience things outside of school, and they may experience things that affect the way they perform in the examination. And we need you to keep us informed if you feel that your child has experienced any of those. There is special consideration that can be applied. I want to make absolutely clear, it isn't a huge amount, it's 1-5% to 5 that the examination, uh, the exam board will, will consider applying if we put in the application for it. So, um, if a student has been ill for a sustained period of time, and if it's an illness, it needs to be for a sustained period of time or at the time of the examination, we need to know, um, and then we can put in that application afterwards. So, if there's anything else that a student has experienced, if you've got something going on in fact you think actually they're, they're really struggling to, to cope with that, if you let us know and appreciate we will be absolutely sensitive with that information, we can put an application for the exam board. Um, we have to do that for seven days after the last exam. So I just mentioned on there, the 26th of June, we have to be putting all of those in in early July. We don't put any in beforehand, they all go in right at the very end because you can't stack them up. Um, it is just the one that carries the highest percentage addition that we would we would Okay, so moving on to revision. A little bit uh, around the science. Some people will be familiar with the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. Um, typically, the programme used to be on is are you smarter than a 10 year old? Remember well, and we'd sit and watch it and think how embarrassing that we weren't smarter than a 10 year old. We knew it once, because once upon a time when we were taught things, we were up there in our memory. And over time, we don't use it, and it is also time. So revision, it's about regularly going back and re-practicing something. And you'll notice here, if you revisit something after a day, you go back up to the top, and the idea around this is that each time you go back up to the top, the curve flattens out. And the more often you revisit something, the stronger it is committed to your long-term memory. I'm not going to go too much into the science about working memory um, and long-term memory, but look, look at a cognitive overload. It's said that we all have a working memory, that any time we're working on a task, that is the memory that's being used. And it can get filled up very, very quickly. And so the idea is that we try and access things from a long-term memory, and we try and access them quickly. In order 
that you do that, the, equip the, the, um, the learning that we put in our long-term memory needs to be in there firmly and securely. And that's why this regular revision will make that stronger so you can recall it quickly. In order to revise well, and this picture here is representing, there needs to be some difficulty to the revision when you're revising. If students are revising something, they're finding it too easy. Um, and what's frustrating me is when students say, I'm going to revise this because I'm good at them. Well, actually, I would argue that's the thing you should be doing last. You should still be having a look at it, but you should be doing it last. And come back to that. And the things you should be doing is the things you find more difficult, and you should visit them more often. If something is more difficult to work on, it is more likely to be committed to the long-term memory. Okay, so if, you, if, you, if your child is struggling with their revision, and it is a desirable difficulty, not sitting there, not, not a clue what's going on, if they find it a little bit difficult, that's a good thing. It's helping them to commit it to long-term memory. Um, in terms of what you can do at home, and some things you can do, is about the equipment and making sure that your child is prepared for every single piece of equipment that they might need. And certainly put up there some recommendations of the equipment that you might have to hand. Okay? And if any of those present any difficulties, any challenges, then that's a conversation with us. Okay? We absolutely appreciate uh, that uh, some people have got all those things to hand. Definitely the key one is the scientific calculator. As a mathematician, students will try and revise the maths in this, with this. And then they'll go into their GCSE, and the calculators do not work anything like an iPad. So they've got to be using a calculator. And they need a scientific calculator that they practice on. Do they have somewhere to work? Now that, of course, is a picture that I've pinched off the internet. Ideally, try and find somewhere that we are going to somewhere to work and go back to regularly. I appreciate that's easier in some households than others. But providing somewhere where they can work um, is really useful in terms of helping them to um, and I'm definitely going to say this and make this absolutely clear. I'm glad you're here this evening because one of the biggest complaints I get is the amount of expectation we put on the, the students to be revising. And one of the biggest complaints year on year is you're expecting too much from them. And then a parent will say, look, you're expecting too much. They're going home, they're sitting in their room, they're there for hours, they don't come out. They come out and feed them and they go back in. And then when we actually look at what the school is asking them to do, what the student expects them to expect to be them to do, they are two very different things. I'm making it absolutely clear that there's got to be that element of enjoyment, that for those breaks, they have to happen. And the things that students enjoy doing, there may need to be a scenario this year where you cut down on some of those things. That may need to happen. You can't do all of these things every single night, but you've got to make sure you find time to do some of those. If you're alive all the time, you will burn out and you won't get the outcome that you want. So please, if your child is telling you that they've got to go and they've got to be in their room every single second of the day, no, they desperately don't. In terms of creating a revision timetable, there are loads out there. Okay, loads of revision timetables. Um, I've gone on Google and it took me a while to scroll, to scroll through and find the form that I liked. And the reason it took me a while is if you are going to create a revision timetable, if you look at the timings down the, right, down the left hand side here, Good revision should only be done for 20 to 25 minutes and then stop. Because you will reach a point where if you try and revise for an hour, and I'm already mindful that if you have about 45 minutes, that I'm moving, you will be more attentive at the start of this presentation, more attentive at the end of the session, and then in the middle, you will start to wait a little bit. I may just shout boo or something to wake everybody up. But 20 minutes is about the time which we can focus attention on. So revision should be for 20 minutes. Stop, take a break. And this is where I'm definitely going to say I am not being that teacher, okay? And this is for yourself to consider. In terms of good revision, and some of the students will think, how on earth could this possibly take place? <laughs> Putting that mobile phone somewhere else in another room, or won't be tied, giving it to somebody else to look after for 20 to 25 minutes is strongly recommended, okay? I'm saying strongly recommended, I'll tell you you have to do it. You have those battles. Um, in terms of um, music, the, the statistical analysis is that no music is best. And some people say, it's okay, I'm going to put some music on that doesn't have any lyrics. Well, actually, the statistical analysis says that, that that is only less damaging to your revision than having music with lyrics. The best statistical analysis is letting no music at all. And certainly, it crazes me when I used to go into the door watching a film whilst revising. No, you cannot do those, those, those things at once. So they're your battles to have, I'll leave them with you. Um, in terms of revision, um, you may have noticed a slight twang in my voice that I'm not a local. Um, some of you might recognise the northern Norfolk coast. 
And in terms of vision, and some of you should be here and should remember that I've done this presentation with you. This is the North Norfolk coast, and when I was much younger, they put these boulders on the coast. And I said to my dad, Dad, what are they there for? Because the power of persistence. That is um, Haysborough. Um, pronounce, uh, pronounce Haysborough, spelled Hattiesburg on the North Norfolk coast. And water is persistently bashed against the coastline, and now uh, my beloved Norfolk is starting to erode away. Resist, uh, revision is just like that. It's little and often, and the impact it has over time is absolutely huge. So how on earth do you revise? How do you revise? And definitely it's different for everybody. Um, I put some suggestions on. They are definitely different for everybody. Find out what works for you and exploit it. So this is uh, things to consider. Quizzing. The aid old of sitting, saying, Mum, Dad, whoever, Uncle, do you ask me some questions? Right? It's a fantastic way to revise. There's loads of apps out there now, so you don't have to ask those questions. You don't have to sit and read through all those questions unless you want to. Uh, there are lots of different apps out there. Um, and uh, some of the resources that are on the booklet I'm going to share with you shortly can direct you to those. But quizzing is a fantastic way to revise. Uh, flashcards. There's a difference between flashcards and just writing out all of your notes, putting them on a, set of it, a pack of these cards like this, and popping them out the way and never looking at them again. That's not going to have an impact. If you're going to create flashcards, it's absolutely got to be the case for the students go back to them and self-test again. Because you're looking to persistently keep going back to, repeating that knowledge, committing it to long-term memory. That will help you withdraw it to your working memory and reduce the cognitive overload. Um, in terms of Cornell note, note taking, and again as a mathematician, I'm, I'm breaking out into a mild sweat now with the, the note taking. Um, this is a, uh, a strategy that students should be familiar with. You break down your notes into three different sections where you've got notes from the lesson, you've got cues, main points, visual clues, and other things that you put down this side, and most importantly, at the bottom, a summary of what it is that you put within your notes. It's just a style of note taking, works well for a lot of students. And for me, I was always somebody that worked well with a mind map. And still, if you've been in my office, if you go to my office, you might see, you'll see my best work is done with a piece of A3 paper and some felt tip pens. And genuinely, if I'm planning something in school, that's absolutely the starting point every single time. Felt tip pens and an A3 paper. So um, you might have, um, due to work well this, you might find, when you, if you are ready to create that space, you've got them dotted all round your walls. And you may have to paint your walls again when the blue tap comes off and you've got that little mark. So graphical organizers is fantastic. Um, and past papers, just doing questions. Uh, this is a very old picture now, students have. It doesn't have to be dull and mundane. And we were actually, that isn't staged, we were actually enjoying some past paper questions there. Everyone recognise that face when you're doing maps, so I'm, I'm not too sure. So just doing practice questions. But if you do do practice questions, please, students do need to mark them. You've got to find out whether you've got it correct or not. And if you haven't, you need to go and find out what the answers were. So you can do it on your own, you can do it in groups. We've just given some ideas there, there are loads. If you type in revision techniques into Google, there are absolutely loads. I've picked out the most common ones. So in terms of what we're going to be sharing with you, and, and I apologise, I apologise, so I'm going to let you know um, Mrs. Mrs. Fogg in, in our admin team, she has told me it's not the most flowery document. She tried. So it's okay, we don't want flowery, we just want information. So I'm going to share this with you, and I'm going to send all this out tomorrow morning. Um, and you've got the revision material booklet. Now I've just given you uh, the first page, first page there, and you can see that for biology, links, activities, resources for revising biology. Now how you do that and how the how dog does that will depend on the different techniques that work best for them. But there are loads of different resources in there. And there's business studies, there's chemistry, every single subject that is studied in year 11, there is an entry in that book. But that's going to come out and do that correctly electronically. Um, we are checked and double checked that all of those links work and go straight to the particular website. So there is a huge amount of resources available there. Um, and then the question is, and this is a difficult one, how can you help in subjects that you may have forgotten? Okay, um, and like I mentioned a moment ago, she wanted to think just going up to um, Edinburgh University. She's doing A-level biology, and my biology wasn't fantastic back in 1994. Um, talking about your way, I know younger than unfortunately. Um, in terms of how you help, I'm going to share something with you, and, and, and no, I'm not ashamed. 
And I love doing jigsaw puzzles, right? You, you know, I know you look at it and think, hey, he's quite a cool guy, and now I've just ruined everything. Um, I love doing jigsaw puzzles, and, right? and I'm confident that some people in here will also enjoy doing them. I love doing these, um, I'm going to pronounce it was each. Um, and if you've never seen them before, it's a puzzle where you don't know what the puzzle is of. So you don't know what you're doing. Okay, so it's a little bit like helping your child when you don't really know what you're doing, but you're going to try and help them anyway. Um, so this is one that I did recently. Um, and what you do is you look at, have I ever seen a problem like this before? Um, and when you help a, a small child do a jigsaw puzzle, it's incredibly infuriating because the small child doesn't know the first rule of jigsaw puzzles. And everyone in the room knows the first rule of jigsaw puzzles, and anybody that's saying you start in the middle, you're absolutely lying. Because everybody knows the first rule of jigsaw puzzles is you start with straight edges and you start with the corners, and that's the first place. So you look at the problem and you think, what, where have I seen a problem like this before? And you think, what have I seen a problem like this before? And is there anything I can apply with what I do know to this problem that I'm not so sure about? And that's what I'd ask you to encourage your child to be thinking in terms of, right, what do you know? What does it look like you've done previously? And in school we try and push etymology where we're looking at and breaking down compartmentalizing words, bio meaning life set. Fantastic. So if you're looking in that, so um, ology mean science. Fantastic. Okay. So we're looking at breaking down and say, what can, where, where can we link it? And then, of course, one of these puzzles where you don't know what the picture's going to be, you then look for on top of it, you look for blocks of colour. And you look for blocks of things that you recognise and you start to put them together. And as you start to put them together, you start to build an image. And that image becomes clearer. And this is the sort of process I'd be encouraging you to go through with the child. And then you find that piece. And you find that piece that quite clearly is called Barbie, and you work out it's a barbecue. Because that's the sort of humour in these jokes is a lot of it, in these puzzles is a lot of it. And then you find that piece. You find that piece that goes, hang on a minute, that goes with that. And you can then link these two together. Okay? And you start to build that bigger picture. You might not get to the very end. But in terms of improving chances of success, and I'll say this, I'll give you the example in maths. Maths, uh, a paper is worth 80 marks. Uh, each paper is worth 80 marks. So 20 papers, you can get every single question wrong and still get 60 marks if you show you're working out, if you get to that point. So you just do as much as you can. And also, you may, you may then unravel the whole picture. You might not, but you've moved on further than you were previously. There we go. So, just going to whiz through um, the core subjects for the mock exams, and just to know what to also be and um, they share with me as well. So, just these are for the mock exams, so students are aware. So, mock exams, exam board is with EDCAS. Um, students are going to do a two hour written exam for uh, English language. That is 60 minutes on non fictional reading, and two times 30 minutes on transactional writing. Students will not be informed what the transactional writing task will be. Okay. We have invested in digital clocks because it's 2023 and we find students really struggle with analog clocks nowadays. So we've got digital clocks in the exam room, for some fortune last year to buy those clocks. And in terms of the two hour breakdown, students are not informed when the time is passed. They are expected to keep on their and I need to spend approximately 60 minutes, approximately 30 minutes, and approximately 30 minutes. In terms of the English literature, this year, for the first time in the mocks, we have instated the two and a half hour practice paper. Students need to practice writing for two and a half hours. Okay, so we've definitely we've got one of those in, and it breaks down again. So, Blood Brothers 45 minutes, and a Christmas Carol 45 minutes, and then Unseen Poetry Analysis and Parents 60 minutes. Again, again, students are not told when to move on, and I'm not allowed to do that in the examination. So close book exam, which is exactly like the real GCC, therefore the students will need to know quotations and context from Blood Brothers and Christmas Carol, and they will not be informed in advance of the essay question. And in science, so they will do the paper one for biology, chemistry and physics if they are combined scientists. That will be an hour and 15 minutes for each of those. And if they are triple scientists, and just, just to remind you again, you can get this PowerPoint so if you want those topics on there. Um, triple scientists, uh, an hour and 45 minutes in biology paper 1, chemistry and physics paper 1, like I say, they'll be only those. Um, in maths, there we go. Uh, in maths, as it stands at the moment, I am currently pulling together the time to have to create that. 
In order to do the student's experience examination, we are definitely going to give them two papers. That would be one, uh, one non-calculator and one calculator paper. Okay? Um, the actual exams in the summer will be one non-calculator and two calculator. If I have the time within the, within the fortnight, I will be stating that third examination as well so the students have got the experience. Um, but I do have to make sure, and certainly I'm really keen to make sure we've got exam for, uh, time for that English literature, that two and a half hour practice, this is the only time students will get uh, practice with that. So just be aware of that. The topics will completely vary between papers. Uh, staff will share a vision list, but essentially it will be everything the students have studied since the start of the year. Um, finally, from me to this evening, PE have asked me to share, and the new I was presenting to you this evening, they've asked me to share some dates and deadlines. Uh, the PE practical evidence, we've got Friday the 21st of December for the practical evidence. The PEPs, the first draft is due on the 3rd of November, the final submission Friday the 15th of December. And then there are some assessments there, but they coincide with the school examinations and um, the mock exams and the light touch. And um, revision sessions, no, that's number four. And um, revision sessions, they will be starting after light touch exams. And revision sessions will start in all subjects and um, go forward over the next uh, however many weeks. One thing I would always ask you about revision sessions, and often a question about when the revision session is starting. Revision sessions are actually put on by staff and um, under their own goodwill. Okay, there isn't an expectation in job descriptions um, that staff are expected for revision sessions. They do because they want to. Um, however, that, what that does mean is it fits in with when the staff are able to do them. So, unfortunately, if staff aren't able to do them on a particular note, we try and accommodate as much as we can. Uh, but please just bear that in mind when those revision sessions are put on in terms of think, why is there not one of those on that night? We'll put on as many as we can. Often with maths, English, science, etc., there's that many of those members of those staff you can go along to, the student can go along another session. So, finally from me, uh, a huge thank you for coming along this evening, um, and the very best of luck to our students. Please do get in touch and get us in return. Are there any immediate questions that people have that feel might be relevant to everybody? And you're allowed to be that parent, you want to be that parent. Now, Mr. Ridgway and I are going to be around for a little bit, but thank you again for coming.